Hello, I am Dr. Jeffrey Delbert, an Associate Professor of Communication at Lenore Ryan University. In this video, we'll talk about information sharing during a pandemic, or how you can effectively manage the massive amounts of information you receive daily. Basically, I just want us to better understand how messaging surrounded COVID-19 has led to some misinformation and confusion, and even exacerbated some partisan divides uh, that maybe already existed. So by the end of this week, hopefully you're able to describe the basics of the information cycle, summarize how partisanship impacts the information, uh, in, in, information consumption, explain how technology imp impacts that information cycle, and also maybe be able to devise an information plan to ensure the legitimacy of our information environment or maybe just your information environment. So it starts with something silly. I, I like being silly. I think that comedy helps diffuse things. But I also think that if you saw my picture for the course, you might have thought, well, that is ridiculous. Why would he choose that photograph? But I chose it on purpose because I thought it would be interesting to use as a master metaphor for the way that we receive information on a daily basis. Not just our news environment, but our political environment in general. It's like a feast, or as I am described sometimes in my public speaking class, trying to use a water, uh, oh shoot, a fire hydrant as a water uh, fountain. And in a feast, right, you know what you like. I really like sweet potato casserole, and I love turkey. I think it's delicious. And so on that day, I could choose to just have those two particular dishes. But even in that one Thanksgiving, right, there's corn, there's pie, there's stuffing, lots of different dishes that people might have brought over to my home. And in that instance, if I didn't sample that, I wouldn't have a really good understanding about maybe some other dishes that people really enjoy, let alone how people are celebrating Thanksgiving at other houses. You might have a vegan Thanksgiving. You might have one that is a is just is filled with vegetables, or you might choose to have ham if you don't like turkey. In all of those instances, right, if we didn't sample other Thanksgivings, it might be hard for us to keep up with what exactly Thanksgiving means. Instead, we rely on what that feast, what that specific meal means to us. And there is so much information, much like a feast of information in our information environment. If you look at this, and this is from 2008, I just thought it was a cool infographic from uh, Domo here, and you can see that, you know, that Amazon ships over, and this is in 2011, we can only imagine what it's like during this pandemic, but internet uses up you know, 70% and streaming's up 12%. Amazon packages certainly are up a, a thousand packages a minute. Or people are, you know, there's over 97,000 users on on uh, Netflix. You know, we know that something like 300, I was, oh man, I forgot the specific fact, but hundreds of hours per second are being uploaded to YouTube for us to watch. In all of those instances, um, it is important for us to keep in mind what exactly is happening in our environment, and yet it is such an overwhelming thing for us to keep track of all the information from a diversity of perspectives, uh, how or to, to understand what's going on in our environment. And so part of what you know, we need to know there is this information cycle and this news information cycle or just what we need to know going on. When we entered into this pandemic, there were lots of information needs, if we start there, um, about what the pandemic was. Who was it going to affect? What about me? Um, is this something that I need to worry about? We had lots of different information needs at the outset somewhere back in March, say for us. Are we going to come back from spring break? What will my job look like for me personally? So, you know, you could set out then collecting information. How Am I going to look at uh, government agencies? Am I going to go to scientific websites? Am I going to ask experts? Am I just going to ask my friends? Do I ask my employers? we set out some sort of information co uh, collection strategies. Now, normally, I think this is mostly we just go to Google and we type something in, right? There was something like tens of thousands of, of Google searches a minute. Um, there, Then we start to collect that data and we analyze it. What do we need to know, right? People may 
or may not go past that first page of the Google search results, but we find out what's happening there. We analyze it. We make some sort of report and recommendation. Whew, the pandemic's not going to impact me. I guess I will go on spring break after all. Um, and then we manage that information and we continue to monitor. Uh-oh, people in my area are uh, getting the, uh, the virus more frequently, or I have heard that blank is going on. And so we have more information needs and we keep going on um, in this part particular um, cycle. And so we start to answer how we get answers, how is that information going to be collected, what happens once that information is collected, and then who is monitoring that information. But basically, these information environments, what we want there is for timely, accurate, complete, and comprehensive information. We want the information that we have to, to come when we need it. We don't want to realize that two weeks after the fact that we needed gloves all along or masks or what the mask needed to look like. Or do we need to buy all the toilet paper in the, uh, in the grocery store, which was genuinely unfortunate? H how accurate is the information? We want it to be complete. We don't want to find out that, okay, I need gloves when I go out, but I need to throw them out before I get back in my car because that's how viruses uh, transmit to other places. This information is undermined, right, this information environment, this timely, accurate, complete, comprehensive environment is undermined by misinformation and and bullshit, right? And we know this is, is true if we think about other pandemics like the uh, Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right, there was lots of min misinformation out there that didn't allow for responders to get to particular places on time or uh, people to refuse treatment when they got there, that bad things were going to happen to them. Um, and, and in other instances, just genuine disinformation, which is just confusing the information environment, which we'll talk about uh, later on. But for now, the what we need to know is just about misinformation and disinformation in general, right? Misinformation is false information that is not given with harmful intent. We might not know enough uh, now, or someone is speaking maybe out of turn, or we were just simply wrong. Uh, in some of this, as we'll talk about, circulates long past when it should. Uh, and then there's also disinformation, right, which is false information intended to deceive. This could be something like uh, bullshit, which is just people speaking when they shouldn't. They, they're just trying to get out of a situation, and they're just trying to make it seem like they have everything under control when they may not, or they may have a plan when they don't. There is propaganda, which are actively promoting falsehoods, uh, much like we saw during the Ebola outbreak, or we... KGB type disinformation campaigns that they ran in Eastern Europe and also uh, some defectors have said that they've run in the United States in years past to try to undermine our fact environment. And you know this is a really important thing for us to think about when we're considering our information. We want timely, accurate, complete, and comprehensive environment. And if we can't trust facts, one of the things that you know is important for us to think about is how can we come up with solutions if we're still arguing about those particular facts? And one thing that we can we really can see emerging in this red blue divide is in, in our news environment this idea of partisanship. Start. I, I started with a, a definition. Liliana Mason um, is a political scientist who talks about this. But social polarization refers to an increased social distance among distinct factions, such as political parties that are prone to emotional volatility, stereotyping, prejudice, and activism. Whereas more, more issue-based polarization uh, is more of a tr traditional polarization, where there's a distinct and increasing distance among the average issue positions of of political factions. And so, you know, in the one hand, there is some social polarization we see happening, which is people feeling emotionally different than other groups of people. And there are still issue positions, right, where now I think that they said something like uh, that the, the fact is something that people report being about seven standard deviations away on their issue positions um, from the opposing party, which is a pretty big um, difference, uh, per perception there. But from a rhetorical perspective, right, polarization is this process by which extremely diversified publics is coalesced into two or more contrasting mutually exclusive groups, sharing a high degree of internal solidarity with those beliefs in which the persuader considers salient. Rather, it's when two distinct groups are able to say that they have very distinct perspectives and beliefs, 
and they ha it's very difficult for people to agree that there are cross-cutting issues such as tax reform or how to handle a pandemic, for instance. And then that news environment, you can see on this Pew Research chart here, our parties in the United States are using media very differently. Democrats report trusting a higher number of sources than Republicans, and this makes a big deal when we talk about just how evidence works or how we trust evidence in general. You know, the, traditionally, the ethos, the character of a speaker, right, that they're competent, that they have good intentions and empathy, you know, you would trust speakers and they could use, you know, existing facts and they would present some sorts of solutions to them. And, you know, there are artistic and inartistic proofs, right, which help prove these cases. Uh, you know, artistic are the, the arguments that people might make, but there were lots of inartistic proofs, a documentary evidence, um, laws, witnesses, contracts, um, oaths. These things could continue to support our information um, in environment. And so, you know, in this environment, of, in this political environment, in our social environment that is extremely polarized, one of the things that makes responding to a pandemic really difficult is that we do not trust evidence and part of disinformation campaigns or environments with lots of misinformation um, and that some uh, ex-KGB officials say that they wanted to do say in the United States was to make it unclear about what sources we could trust in general and we would be unable to support facts uh, as a as a country, as a nation, as a large social group, which makes it very difficult for us to come up with particular solutions there. And part of it, you know, not just it isn't just. I'm not saying that there's some grand conspiracy here, but our general our TV environment, you know, with reality TV, both in news and in our entertainment uh, sector, impact what viewers believe to be real is the footage doctored is it cut up in a very interesting way and we see news organizations playing around with that as well and there's this idea of the celebrity in politics which you know Dreisens and Kellner say are even more important right where Obama is able um, to pass policies only because he's a celebrity or um, you only you think that President Trump is doing a a terrible job because you don't like who he is as a celebrity. And we see people using that celebrity um, as a slur as well, right? Focusing on that person. But I'm getting a little off, off track of what I was hoping to say here. But, you know, trusting the evidence is important. And, you know, since cable news especially, especially has come up, um, many scholars have found that news sources rely on sound bites or rely on uh, information from Reuters or the AP News. And so we end up seeing the same ideas recycled over and over again and not a lot of good in-depth reporting that we, we can trust someone is giving us, you know, not just the complete information, but comprehensive too, helping us, guiding us through this information as well. Um, so... This is exacerbated in some ways by our technology in information environments in general, right? Can we find the information that we seek? We have, you know, one of Tigni Taro, one of my favorite comedians, says, you know, oh, that seems like a very Googleable question when talking about, you know, people asking her questions that are dumb or her partner asking those questions. And, you know, on our information environments, on social media, in the news in general, there is an incredible amount of information. And anyone can post a website, a blog, social media, and they're categorized in, in some ways on this large database, which is the Internet. Some information isn't necessarily private. Um, we know that poor information continues to live on in some particular way. Um, this is really troublesome that there isn't a lot of fact checking as we'll talk about in a moment here that occurs on these particular sites and as marshall McLuhan talks about this media right there's all sorts of interesting content that persists in our technology but we're missing the point of how we're getting to that particular information and in these in these 
times, I think that it's important to recognize right, that social media and their algorithms are curating our messages. When you go on Google, if you and somebody else in the same room search the same search terms and you're both logged into a Google account, you will receive different results. Um, this is, in, in unprecedented times, we are being guided to information without really thinking about that ethos, the trustworthiness of the algorithm that's providing us with information. They're giving us information that they believe that we want, but it might not necessarily always be the most comprehensive information that we want. And McLuhan, you know, once had a typo on his book cover, The Medium is the Massage, when he was attempting to say the medium, the media is the message. It's important to remember that not every citizen is exposed to the same information, both from a news perspective and, uh, you know, from a political sp perspective as well. We have a big burden on us to make sure that we are continuing to dig into information and not assuming that we are always getting comprehensive information about say, the coronavirus or whatever else we might be facing. And there are people doing this work, right? You see PolitiFact here where they, you know, have this meter of mostly true to mostly false. There's a pants on fire rating as well, which is a fun way of doing that. Um, Twitter has attempted to do something like that. Facebook says they are not going to fact check these environments. But it we get facts every day, right? And they continue to persist in these misinformation continues to persist after we have unattributed. We don't remember who said it. We don't remember the credibility of that person. But that fact continues to live on either in our oral uh, passing on of information or on our websites um, in social media in general. We see memes recycled all the time on social media that continue to peddle misinformation. So, you know, like the one article we said, right, you need to be intentional about what you read. You need to stick to trustworthy sources. Do you know who the source is? Who is the original source? Also, take a breath after you read it. Make sure that that, that, that sort reread it. Don't allow that sort of social polarization, that emotional pull to lead you through that story. And then this is a big one, confirm that information. Make sure that that information is true across sources, that multiple people are reporting it, and it isn't some sort of errant information there. So we get into the, the end here about what we actually um, can do as citizens or what we should demand. One thing is thinking about, in general, just health crisis risk communication, ensuring that our organizations that are in charge of our health or the well-being of that the infrastructure actually has enough resources to provide us with information in that timely fa fashion, in an accurate way, and that they can provide us with something comprehensive, a and we know where to find it. So in this instance, we, we should expect our health organizations to be able to talk within each, within their, within departments in general. Okay, you know, Rebecca, do you have this particular piece of information? When are you going to send it out? Peter, when are you going to do this? Um, a good internal communication plan, a good way of getting that message out to the, to the public. When are we going to get messages? How frequently? What will we, we have? And of course, this will depend on the type of situation, right? Situations that are low outrage, high hazard, you might not necessarily need to be quite as immediate. You could be, you know, slow moving and be very methodical about those information. Something like global warming that maybe is a high hazard to our world. Um, people aren't that upset about it. Most people aren't that upset about it. We can continue to, to, um, present information, but something with high outrage, high hazard, something like the coronavirus outbreak, where people are very upset, very nervous, very scared, and it had a very high death rate, you need to have a very specific plan about how to get out timely, accurate information on a regular basis to try to keep up with the information cycle, the information needs that people will have, who's going to be analyzing that data, who's... I mean, and who's going to be monitoring how people are reacting or what they what sorts of information people need uh, in in large measure right we see we saw those press conferences ad hoc sort of thrown together in the beginning that weren't uh, necessarily uh, always very helpful but we then we saw someone like dr. fauci emerge and sort of lead us through this lead many of Americans through the crisis giving us accurate information being that trustworthy leader that we were hoping 
for in the medical um, profession. What about you? What can you do? Um, you can expect timely resources. So in, you know, I'm going to, I think what we're asking you to think about your own communication plan during a crisis. How do we correct misinformation? How do we expect timely resources? How do organizations or citizens get things in a timely way? Right. In some ways, we ask experts to provide information and also care, right? Care about the people that are suffering or don't have enough resources in, in some way. Right? This is part of that emotional labor that makes us feel connected to one another. You can look for and request consistent, constant messaging, making sure that you're not falling into some sort of abyss of non-communication and you're not sure what's going on. In some ways, you can demand media literacy resources. I know that schools across the United States are starting to uh, employ more courses in K through 12 about media literacy. How do we navigate a this dense feast of information? Uh, make sure that you use the resources that are provided out there by private enterprise, by government, about how to accurately get this information and sort through it all. Part of that's using fact checkers. Um, you know, it's really hard to confirm information like we talked about it earlier on, but fact checkers help us do that and parse through a lot of information that we find uh, really difficult to compare sources. Who do I trust? Which is the source that is better here? I think also uh, there was a report from the United Nations about encouraging digital government. Um, at the end of March, only 50%, 57% of governments had online portals, which was about, rose to 86% in April. And this is really good, right? If we have services that we need from our government, in being able to reach them at a time where we can't go to offices is really important. Uh, part of that might be partnering with different stakeholders in the community to make sure that those services are we can still get our normal services, um, food, water, electricity, health concerns uh, addressed. And of course, you know, lots of temporary measures have been instituted, but making sure that we all follow up with our local governments, making sure that our communication strategies and our infrastructure is set up in a way to deal with the shortcomings we might have seen in our own communities. And part of that too is just managing misinformation and disinformation in our media environment. How do we make sure that we're not just relying on uh, national organizations for information, but also make sure that our local governments are providing us with good, solid, reliable, timely information as well. And we've seen, you know, following up on that, we've seen different countries early around, there was a, the map that I forgot to address, but different countries have instituted media laws about peddling misinformation and disinformation and making it uh, maybe not always criminal, but punishable in some particular ways. So in sum, what I hope that you, I mean, thinking about the intersection of politics, media information impacts our own agency in this crisis. If we don't have good information, it's hard for us to make difficult decisions. If we don't all agree on facts, it's hard to come up with particular solutions. So one of the things that I, I hope to talk about this, I mean, there is a massive amount of information in our information cycles but we need to be able to parse through it. Maybe not individually, but help each other find consistent facts and make sure that our information environment has solid facts that we can rely on so that when it comes to negotiation, when it comes to these democratic processes, we don't have to quibble over what is true and untrue, but can come to better, uh, better solutions for our local communities and national uh, communities as well, international. This helps us stay, they stay safe, it helps us protect our human rights, and part of this is just going to be having new plans of how we should get information, what information we should get, how often we should get it, and from whom we should receive that information. Um, if you have any questions, I, I will, of course, be uh, with you on Thursday night, uh, but if you have any, you feel free to contact me, and I'd love to talk about things. I hope you have a great day.